How would you like to own a piece of a company that has been providing some of the absolute best software that has completely revolutionized the way we do content for decades? Because that's the subject of today's video, Adobe. Hey everybody, and welcome back to Dollars and Cents, helping you make sense of making dollars. In 1982, Adobe made its debut, offering its first products, PostScript, a programming language, and the first digital fonts. Adobe really gained notoriety in the mid-80s with the release of Adobe Illustrator for the Macintosh. Interestingly, Steve Jobs offered to buy Adobe for $5 million back in the 1980s, an offer that Adobe refused. Adobe started developing even more programs throughout the 80s and 90s, building up an impressive suite of products. The early 1990s saw a few of Adobe's revolutionary products enter the market for the first time. Adobe Premiere in 1991, its first crack at editing software, and Adobe Acrobat Reader in 1993. With the introduction of Adobe Acrobat came the monumental introduction of the PDF file type. By 1999, Adobe brought in over $1 billion in revenue and got swept up in the tech craze of the 1990s. It was actually one of the few companies to later pass its 1990s all-time highs. Since then, Adobe continued to grow rapidly, launching its first iteration of the Adobe Creative Suite in 2003. In a stock swap in 2005, Adobe acquired its biggest rival, Macromedia, and continued to make many beneficial acquisitions. Of course, Adobe has a lot more history than what I've briefly mentioned here, including many more incredible products that seamlessly work together. But we don't have all the time in the world to talk about that. Now, it's time to move on to the beat of this video and talk more about Adobe's future, starting with their financials. As usual, we'll first look at revenue growth, a fundamental aspect of any company. Looking at the past five full years, Adobe brought in $4.8 billion in 2015 in revenue. That jumped to $12.8 billion in 2020. Its market cap stands at 280 3 billion, yes, billion, and at Adobe size, that's pretty incredible growth. Establishing revenue growth, we next need to see what Adobe's doing with its shares outstanding or whether or not it's buying back those shares, thus increasing your ownership stake in the business. In 2015, Adobe had approximately 498.7 million shares outstanding. Now, in 2020, that number has dropped to 481 million shares outstanding. That drop indicates that Adobe is buying back about 4% of its shares over the last five years. The next metric out for evaluating Adobe is its total current assets versus total current liabilities. Its total current assets stands at $8.08 .08 billion against its total current liabilities of $6.1 billion, including a bank-busting $5.77 billion in total cash. With that much cash, Adobe could nearly pay off all of its short-term debts. Following that, we have the almighty cash flow section to examine. Adobe has increased its free cash flow from $1.28 billion in 2015 to an astounding $5.31 billion in 2020. If we take the average of the last five years of free cash flow and multiply it by 20, we get an expected market cap of $82 billion. From a free cash flow perspective, this means that Adobe is overvalued by 245%. While this number alone shouldn't determine if you invest or not, it should still be considered. The last part of our financial analysis is return on invested capital, or ROIC, and the dividends. Adobe touts an impressive 15.9% return on invested capital capital over the last five years. This is rapidly increasing. Just last year, the ROIC stood at 21.67%. For the first time in Adobe's history, they managed to crack 20. Now, as for dividends, well, Adobe doesn't pay any. Yeah, it just sticks to share buybacks for that shareholder yield. Now that we've had this peek into Adobe's financials, it's time to look at its products and its future in the market. I'd wager that many of you have heard of Adobe's flagship product, the relatively new Adobe Creative Cloud, first launched in 2015. It's the largest part of Adobe's revenue and seems to be the final iteration of the Adobe Creative Suite, first introduced in 2003. An estimated 15 million people use the program or a part of it. It offers everything from Photoshop, a photo editing software, and Premiere Pro, a video editing software, to After Effects, a visual effects software. Software. However, these are just a few of the 20 plus programs you have access to with the Creative Cloud. In 2015, with the premiere of the Creative Cloud, Adobe switched from its traditional payment model to subscription based. Before this method of payment, Adobe put out a new version of the Creative Suite at prices ranging from $300 plus for students to an $1,800 plus one time fee for everyone else looking to update the entire suite. Now, Adobe charges a flat fee of $53 a month or $600 a year. This new system gives its users more overall programs and regular updates. 
and rakes in far more money for Adobe. You can see this in the takeoff of Adobe's revenue with the subscription-based payment model, starting in 2015. In 2010, Adobe's revenue was $3.9 billion, but by 2015, it had only grown to $4.8 billion. Then it absolutely skyrocketed to $12.8 billion in the next five years, ending in 2020. This spike in five years shows just how effective this new model has been. Of course, Adobe has also introduced other aspects to its business model too, including the Adobe Experience Cloud, in 2017. The Adobe Experience Cloud is the unification of three other Adobe products, the Adobe Analytics, Marketing, and the Advertising Cloud. It brings in around $800 million of revenue, or roughly 5% of Adobe's total revenue. You can reasonably call it a rival to Salesforce, though Salesforce is still by far a larger and more expansive program. The Adobe Experience Cloud also seamlessly integrates with other Adobe products, like the Creative Cloud. On the other hand, you have Adobe's Document Cloud, which I believe is the smallest part of Adobe, only bringing in around $500 million of revenue. This service was also launched in 2015 and works similarly to its main competitor, DocuSign. However, though the smallest breadwinner in Adobe's arsenal, the Document Cloud has already matched half of DocuSign's total revenue. With its incredibly vast resources, it's no wonder that Adobe dominates the competition, launching new services that seamlessly integrate with its array of other products. In addition to these new products, Adobe has made some smart acquisitions over the year that have increased its revenue. In 2011, it acquired X Sign, which no doubt helped the development of the document cloud. Adobe then acquired Behance in 2012, Magento in 2018, and Workfront just last year. Yet this isn't even half of Adobe's acquisitions. There are even more, but we still don't have all day to talk about them. However, I love seeing companies make smart acquisitions like these, not just acquiring or divesting for the sake of it. When companies get to Adobe's size, it usually becomes increasingly harder for them to invest capital back into their business and get an outsized return, not Adobe. In fact, the company's ability to invest at high rates of return only seem to be getting better every year. Yes, some of their main business components seem to be slowing down, but Adobe has a dedicated management team that continues to innovate in all sorts of fields across a wide spectrum of business. Bottom line, Adobe is still growing. Yet, what all this comes down to is whether or not you want to invest in Adobe, taking into account its financials, current products, and how they will change and adapt in the future. For me, right now, I think the content titan is overpriced. Trading at a P above 50 plus a free cash flow multiple of over 70 is, in my opinion, a definite investing turnoff. If Adobe's stock comes down to the $250 range, I'll definitely buy into the company, but $250 is a far cry from its current price. Who knows, though, what the future might bring? Until then, Adobe is certainly still on my wish list. If it's on yours too, let's talk on my Discord, link in the description. Over the years, Adobe has definitely provided some of the best products on the market, whether that's the creation of the PDF, or the Creative Cloud, or even its experience in document clouds. What Adobe has managed to do is create a diverse array of products that work seamlessly together with user experiences that effectively help content creators at the corporate and individual levels. With the age of the content creator and the dawn of the so-called creator-based economy at hand, who stands better poised to provide the most optimal tools than the proven Adobe? I hope you enjoyed this video on the content titan. Be sure to leave your opinions on Adobe in the comments below and leave a like if you enjoyed, and I will see all of you in the next episode of Dollars and Cents.